I'll just advance from here. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Lambert and uh, Jorge, and um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, my name is Robert Opp. I'm the Director of Innovation and Change Management at the United Nations World Food Program. I'm normally found in Rome, but happen to be in New York this week for other meetings, so it's a real pleasure to be here in person for once um, and, uh, and be able to, to have this dialogue on uh, blockchain, which is really one of the important and trending technologies that we are looking at. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the reason why we look at blockchain or any technology first before then telling you about the actual uh, pilot project that we have with Syrian refugees based in Jordan. Um, and then a few thoughts on the future of blockchain usage in the World Food Program. So we always start with the problem we're trying to solve. And so we start with the problem of global hunger, which still affects one in nine people. Uh, or around 815 million people, the latest estimates. And so starting from the problem we're trying to solve and looking at, as, as we know, the challenge that the, the world has put forward for the SDGs to end hunger by 2030, as well as the achievement of the other SDGs. And when you consider the trend of hunger going from, we've made progress in, in aggregate terms in hunger over the last 20 years, but actually at the current rate of progress, we're not going to make it. In fact, the last two years saw an uptick in hunger. And that's largely due to some acute hunger uh, additions to the, to, to the, 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 the statistics and, and things. But the fact is, at the current rate of progress, we will not make the end of hunger by, by 2030. And so we're constantly looking for levers in the World Food Program on how we're going to make more progress. And we see innovation as one of those levers that we can use. Not the only lever, but one of them. And that's why we spend time looking at things like artificial intelligence, like uh, agri-tech, agri mobile connect connectivity and connectedness and what that can mean, um, the rise of, of easy to access digital entrepreneurship and, and uh, connected entrepreneurs coming from all parts of the globe, and blockchain as one of the technologies that we see as having a great potential to shift the way that we work um, in, a, in a, a way that makes us more efficient and more effective. And one of the modalities we use to do that is something called an innovation accelerator that we've created. It's based in Munich, Germany, supported with generous contributions from the government of Germany. And we really have a, a methodology and a platform that is an infrastructure in the organization to support innovation. And what it does is look for ideas within the organization as well as outside the organization that have potential to improve the way that we do our programs and in general will contribute to the anti-hunger ecosystem out there, whether that's a business ecosystem or in public institutions and so on. And so we do programs uh, that are uh, quick programs called boot camps that bring teams in that are looking at certain problem spaces and they want to prototype solutions. And then we can support teams with small grants to, to do that over a three to six month period. We call those sprints. We then are focusing on scale-ups um, that have a, a corporate potential to, to increase effectiveness across the organization. Um, and we are putting together an innovation fund uh, to allow us to support those scale-ups the, the, across the organization. So for those of you from, who are from donor member states, we're looking for funds to contribute to the innovation fund. Forgive me, I just had to throw that in there. My team wouldn't forgive me if I didn't. Um, so, so we built a platform for, for looking at scanning the horizon for new technologies and then trying to embrace them and bring them into the organization and elaborate them to the point where they can have impact. Um, and so one of the spaces that we are really interested in is that the World Food Program, many of you will know, um, has been in existence for about 50 years. And for most of that existence, we have been involved in delivering, delivering physical food commodities uh, to various parts around the world, purchased locally or purchased internationally. But increasingly, the World Food Program is working on cash-based assistance as well. And that is in the form of some sort of voucher where you're given an, a cash-linked uh, entitlement to go to a retail store and purchase something, or it can also be an unrestricted cash, meaning just cash in hand, and you can do what you want with it, knowing that most poor households spend 60 to 70 percent of their household income on food. And so, the World Food Program has actually become the largest cash uh, distributor in the humanitarian system. From about $180 million in 2012, so about five, six years ago, last year we delivered $1.4 billion worth of cash assistance. 
And there's lots of ways that we look for uh, improvements to efficiency and effectiveness of those programs. But coming back to the idea of embracing technologies, uh, we put out a call around across the organization on problems that might be solved with blockchain. And one of our colleagues from our finance department said, I've been reading articles, I've been thinking about this for a while, we think we could use blockchain in the back-end payment system of some of these cash programs using the ledger, the distributed ledger function as the way of tracking and tracing transactions and reconciliations. And I'll, I'll explain that. So when we do cash-based transfers, um, we generally do need to work uh, with financial intermediaries. Um, and that incurs costs because we have to, any intermediary we, we have, we have to pay a fee to. Um, there's some risk involved because we actually need to transfer some aspect of identities of, of our beneficiaries to a third party. We also need to transfer funds to a third party. Um, so there's the privacy issue as well with related to the identities. And then we have to do reconciliations, which adds more cost, and there's a speed element. So all of these things are in our minds as we look at these large-scale large cash programs. And one of the solutions that we've come up with and piloted is what we call building blocks. And building blocks is a blockchain-based um, payment uh, transaction backend that we've, we've built and plugged into our, uh, one of our digital voucher programs that reaches Syrian refugees in Jordan. Um, and it's based on the Ethereum uh, protocol, which Ariana has just been explaining. Um, we started, according to our sort of way of embracing innovation and working at a really fast pace for minimum viable product, we actually started testing this in, um, in Pakistan with 100 people using SMSs to see if we could actually use the blockchain as a tracing platform, and that was successful. And within five months, we'd moved it to a digital voucher program that was already existing in Jordan, and we, we scaled it up to 10,000 people. So there's 10,000 Syrian refugees that are receiving their cash entitlements. Um, as of last May, there were 10,000 um, via a blockchain-based system. Um, the way it works is, in this system already, there was an iris scan um, in place, which is a shared platform with the High Commissioner for Refugees. Syrian refugees are registered by HCR when they enter the country. They are biometrically linked to a database with the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights based on a scan of their iris. They are then, um, the UNHCR then passes us the data of, of people that require assistance. We've determined uh, that ca the uh, digital voucher program is the most appropriate in that particular environment. And what we would do in the existing or, or previous program is that we would pass on that information to uh, a local financial service provider, names of people, and we'd transfer funds. The so financial service provider would create wallets for those people and then be responsible for tracing and reconciling the transactions and the payments all the way to the point of the retailer. And for that um, service, we get charged about 1.5% in Jordan. Um, and so, what we did in the blockchain pilot was we said, well, actually, if we had a more secure technology ourselves, if we had a, a, a better way of doing this, we potentially could um, do the transaction reconciliations ourselves. And that's exactly what we did. So now we have a blockchain system. We take the names, we register people on the blockchain with the, the iris scan uh, identity. We create uh, wallets for them. And then we handle all of the reconciliation because the audit trail, the, the transaction trail that blockchain provides, there's so much data that comes out of that platform and it's quite secure, as we've just discussed. We're able to do the reconciliations ourselves and we transfer funds to the retailers that have provided the, the goods in bulk and in every two week period. So it's a way of really, um, in this case, creating more efficiency. We don't replace the role of banks. We still require banks um, for lots of different services. But for this particular program and this particular payment service, we don't require those, those services and we don't incur those fees anymore. Um, and that means that it's a more efficient program. It's also more uh, transparent and we have our inspector general looking at this right now to look at the audit trail that it provides and looking at this technology as a basis of what we could do in terms of scaling up. 
Um, we feel it's more secure and more confidential because we're not transferring people's names and, and funds to a third party. At the moment, um, I mentioned that, that we were uh, working with initially 10,000 people in Jordan. That's now scaled to 100,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan. And over the next few months, we hope to scale that to the entire program in Jordan, which is about 500,000 people. And we've transacted about $9 million through the, uh, the, the blockchain-based system so far with um, probably 10 times that amount or 100 times that amount in transactions, actual transactions. Um, I think I've just already foreshadowed this slide, which is um, what we're doing now is we're scaling this within the program. So we're figuring out how does this interface with corporate systems and um, uh, like our, our corporate ERP system, uh, which is SAP based. So how does that work in terms of integration? Um, how do we scale to all of the, the people that we reach in Jordan? Um, can we look at piloting different modalities with this, taking it to different countries? Um, and the exciting part about blockchain, and another benefit that I didn't mention on the slide, is that it really lends itself to collaboration as well. So it's quite easy to integrate others, either on the same blockchain or link different blockchains. And we're already talking to a few different agencies about how that could look, and we're going to pil start piloting over the next couple of months in that regard. So we start to see the building of a, a blockchain ecosystem among agencies, potentially. Um, Final thoughts, um, the future of blockchain and WFP were, so I've mentioned this application in a payment, uh, one of our payment programs for digital vouchers, but we're starting now an exploration at looking at our physical supply chain as well. So um, we're going to start with our Djibouti to Ethiopia corridor and we're going to start looking at whether we can improve the efficiency and the transparency of, and the accountability therefore, of the physical supply chain of the massive amount of food that gets or that arrives in the port of Djibouti and then has to be shipped across uh, parts of East Africa. Um, secondly, there's a lot of discussion across the system about digital identification and whether blockchain is a technology that could potentially underpin digital ID. Um, this is not something where WFP takes the lead, but it's something that um, we are increasingly moving toward digital programs. We have a uh, we reach about 80 million people in a year. We have about 26 million names in our database right now, so digital um, ID records for people. And how could we link these up with government identification systems, with other agency identification systems? We want to make sure that we're having a coherent and a consistent kind of infrastructure there. Um, and then another uh, sort of thought that would actually help us overall is, um, for example, putting land tenure for small farmers on blockchain. So in places where um, land tenure or land rights are not particularly um, codified now or secure, we, we think that something like a blockchain-based system when you have um, your, your land rights would be codified on a blockchain in an immutable record, as Ariane was talking about, um, that could really have a benefit. Um, the same goes, frankly, for all of your economic history. So all of the, the transactions, as you, as you are, are building your history on a blockchain of some kind, even a WFP payment uh, system, you're sort of building an economic track record there. And if you unfortunately are displaced from your home and you have to cross a border or you're moved to a different place, in the future, your history could be following you because you would have that stored in the blockchain. And that's a future that we really look toward uh, whether that has a real potential for us to kind of create that coherent history for people that they don't have to start from zero if they find themselves unfortunately um, displaced or, um, or, or their livelihoods have been destroyed because of some shock. Um, so I will leave it at there. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, my contacts are also here um, on the screen. Was I almost on time? Yeah, okay. <laughs>